Welcome to A Look Ahead. We are looking at the Sabbath School lessons for the first quarter of 2012. And this is lesson number seven in this series entitled Glimpses of Our God. And this particular lesson, lesson is entitled The Lord of the Sabbath. This is the lesson for February 18 of 2012. Before we begin, could we bow our heads together for a word of prayer? Our loving Father, we recognize you as Lord of all, including the Sabbath. Help us to understand better today as a result of our discussion together what that might mean, especially with reference to the Sabbath, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you've already guessed, this lesson is about the Sabbath and the Lord of the Sabbath. And to sort of get us in the general ballpark of what we're talking about, I'd like to read a few verses from John 1. In the beginning, the Word already existed. I'm reading from my Good News translation. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. From the very beginning, the Word was with God. Through Him, God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without Him. The Word was a source of life, and this life brought, to light, hum, brought light to humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never put it out. Clearly, this is one of the clear passages in Scripture about Jesus being the Creator. We move on. God sent His messenger, a man named John, who came to tell people about the light so that all should hear the message and believe. He himself was not the light. He came to tell about the light. This was the real light, the light that comes into the world and shines on everyone. The Word was in the world. Now we're back to talking about Jesus. And though God made the world through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own country, but his own people did not receive him. Some, however, did receive him and believed in him, so he gave them the right to become God's children. They did not become God's children by natural means, that is, by being born as the children of a heavenly human father, God himself was their father. Now, in this passage, we have the Bible talking to us about Jesus being the Lord of the Sabbath in the sense that he was the creator of all. We also have, him, the, the passage also talks about uh, him being our Redeemer, our Savior, who came to this earth, particularly to the Jewish people uh, in that, that day, and being our Redeemer. So we have this member of the Godhead whose primary responsibility is to relate God to his creatures, uh, being the one who is the Creator and the Redeemer. To illustrate that, we know that in heaven, he was called Michael the Archangel. We find that in several places in Scripture. It's, it's in Daniel, it's in Revelation. But we need to recognize that the word Michael means who is like God or the one who is like God. It was Michael the Archangel who led heaven's armies against Lucifer or Satan in his rebellion in the courts of heaven, and you read about that in Revelation 12, 7 through 12. Jesus had moved among the angels as if he were an angel, until many of the angels must have thought that he was like one of them. You wonder whether Lucifer, later to be Satan, really believed that Jesus was no more than an angel. Surely he must have known more, better than that. But he didn't want to believe that he was more than an angel. Maybe that was the, the key. Well, in response to the sin problem which began in heaven, God created this world with its new and distinct order of beings. Now, for those of you who are interested in reading more about that, that's a quotation from Mellon White found in Review and Herald of February 11, 1902. It can also be found in Volume 1 of the Bible Commentary, page 1081. As human beings, we have the ability to procreate and produce little human beings like ourselves, sometimes a whole lot too much like ourselves. Not even Lucifer or Satan has that ability. Did you realize that you have a power that not even Satan has? So what does all this teach us about the Lord of the Sabbath? Now that was all introduction. 
Now let's jump into the subject. When God created this world and placed the beautiful Garden of Eden in it, and in that garden, Adam and Eve, the devil, God's adversary, the devil means or means God's adversary, Satan, God's adversary, immediately demanded access to the new couple. And we know all about that. God recognized the danger of allowing Satan to have unlimited access to them. We know what would have happened if he had had unlimited access to them, don't we? So he limited the devil to one tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. At the same time, God with his absolute commitment to fairness and freedom limited himself to, in his access to the couple. He did not walk with them wherever they went, warning them and protecting them against the devices of Satan. But God needed a special time when he could have fellowship with them and teach them about himself. That special time we call the Sabbath. As God created our world step by step, he saw that each creation was good. When human beings were created with freedom and in the image of God, he pronounced them very good. But on the last day of creation week, he created something quite different. It was not a holy place or a holy mountain that he created, but a holy period of time set apart for fellowship with God. Since our lives and our salvation depend on a trusting relationship with God, the Sabbath is central in that relationship. So my first major question for you this evening, why do you think God chose a period of time as a memorial to him, instead of something else more material, for example. We have lots of examples of what people have done with places and things. Mm -hmm. uh, that um, I suspect he didn't want to, uh, didn't want to go there, didn't want to talk about that, didn't want, didn't want that to happen. Didn't it's some substitutes for him. Yeah, it's 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 hard to to make a false copy. It's uh, yeah. So you're saying you're asking if you're asking why did God create that time? I'm asking why did it, I mean God could have chosen theoretically at least God could have chosen anything as a symbol or a, a way of of worshiping Him. He could have chosen an idol if he wanted to. He didn't. He chose a period of time. My question to you is why did he choose a period of time? I'm trying to understand this period of time because you're suggesting then that, uh, that there is time when you don't have that period of time. No, I'm saying that God, God didn't give us that option. He could have, but he didn't. He said, here's six days and there's the seventh day. And oh. that day, you, you know, you don't have to worship me, but my, my, my gift to you, my challenge to you is to worship me on that day. That's the time I want to have special fellowship with you. So the other time they won't worship him? Well, I, I in, don't quite in, understand. Okay, in the garden, mm -hmm. God said, okay, Satan, I'm limiting you to this one tree. That's the only place you can approach Adam and Eve. And Satan, in effect, said, well, but you have access to them all the time, everywhere they go. And God says, well, okay, then I will limit myself to one particular day. Now, I'm going to be in touch with them whenever they ask all week long. But the special time that I'm going to spend with them is the Sabbath. That's the time we, we don't just brush shoulders. We sit down, we talk, and we interact, and we really learn about each other. This kind of an interesting thing with having to do with the way the order of creation. Mm -hmm. The first three days, it seems like God created spaces, mm -hmm. created the main space. Then he created the firmaments, mm -hmm. then created land with mm -hmm. the plants and everything. Then came back and started filling mm -hmm. those spaces one at a time, put the orbital bodies in, in, the, in there, put the birds and the fish in the next mm -hmm. space, and put the animals and man on the earth space. However, he, he filled those spaces. However, the Sabbath day, what did he want to put in that space? 
he wanted to fill that with himself. Mm -hmm. And we could come to him and react in, in that way, in a special way, is as he filled that point of time mm -hmm. with himself. We leave the other things. Mm -hmm. Well, let's read the words that the Bible uses to describe that. I'm turning to Genesis 2, 1 to 3. And so the whole universe was completed. That would be the heavens and the earth. By the seventh day, God finished what he had been doing and stopped working. He blessed the seventh day and set it apart as a special day. That's a holy day. Because by that day, he had completed his creation and stopped working. And that is how the universe was created. Okay? Uh, isn't that kind of a definition of a Sabbath right then? When you when you worked and finished something and then it's finished. And then you rest. rest comes naturally because you finished. Mm -hmm. So um, isn't that... Isn't that really the time, the time of the rest after the, the um, creation? Yeah. Which may be pointing to what he just did mm -hmm. to understand whether it was good, bad, or whatever. I, I'm suggesting that God made a period of time as his monument to him for several reasons. The most important one is this. We can't speed it up. We can't slow it down. We have no control over it. Time goes by at its own speed. In fact, in effect, it controls us. We can't, if God had said, well, well, let's just say God says, okay, for the rest of eternity, I'm going to make Jerusalem as the place where you come to worship me. Well, then we would all have to figure out how to get to Jerusalem. It would be difficult, you know, and how often would we go, etc. Or maybe he'd make multiple places. It would still be the same. We'd have to, it'd be difficult to get there. Only some people would have more access than other people. They would live there. Or another alternative that has been suggested, well, what if God made, let's just say, a special kind of white stone that represented him? That maybe give off light or something like that, you know? And everybody could have access to it. But what would happen if we did that? Sure. We would be manipulating yeah. that stone. Some of us would have more of it than others, and we would say we're better off or whatever. We would do all kinds of things to manipulate that. But there is essentially no way we can ma manipulate time. It controls us. We can misuse it. We can ignore it. Part of, but it doesn't matter whether we ignore it. It goes by at a steady speed. And, and so so we, can't, we can't really manipulate it. Now you're tying the Sabbath to creation right mm -hmm. there. But there's other parts in the Bible where the Sabbath is tied to being freed from the Egyptians. We're going we're gonna to talk about in a moment. Okay, so um, it's, it looks to me like we're talking about an end of a work all the time between those two. Okay, let's, let's look at Not that. Not necessarily a monument. That the, the, if, if I just said to you, where is the Sabbath commandment? Almost all of you, including all conservative Christians, would say, well, go to Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Let me read that from my Good News Bible. It's not quite the same as the King James that probably many of us memorized, but here it is. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me, to be filled by me, as you suggested on that day, no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, not the foreigners who live in your country. In six days, I, the Lord, made the earth, the sky, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, I rested. That is why I, the Lord, blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. So, what should we learn from those details? God was giving a rationale. Mm -hmm for why we should be involved with the Sabbath. Yes, very good. And it has to do with his power and his majesty. Yeah. It also does some other things. How many people are supposed to rest? Everybody. Even the animals. So in a sense, the Sabbath is a great equalizer. We would say everyone, in fact, the Bible tells us everyone is supposed to come and worship before God on that day. And you don't, it isn't just the rich people, 
it, it, although this has been abused in some cases, I understand, but basically we're all supposed to come to the same church, sit on the same pews, worship God together as a group, without any special places for anybody. Now, I'll tell you that in ancient times, um, the Jews did some very interesting things with this. If you look at some of the ancient synagogues, you'll find out that there was a seat called the Seat of Moses in the center, in the front of the synagogue. And if you were one of the really important people in town, you sat across the front of the, uh, the, 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 of the synagogue, and the rest of the people sat back in the rows facing you. And so there were some priorities here, but that was not part of God's original plan. Now, that sitting in the best seats? Yeah. And Jesus talks about Talked sitting about in the seat of Moses, right. judging, et cetera, et cetera. But this, this is also a little bit like his signature. Mm -hmm. yeah. he's, saying, he's saying, I'm commanding this, mm -hmm. and I can command it because I am God, mm -hmm. and I created you, and I created everything else. Yeah. So this is the way I want it. This is, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things we usually don't mention, we don't talk about in the fourth, well, we sometimes call it the fourth commandment. It should be more correctly called the Sabbath commandment because in some communions, the Roman Catholic communion, for example, they tend to call it the third commandment, um, the way they, have, they leave out what we call the second and so forth. But anyway, the Sabbath commandment. One aspect of that that we often don't mention is that we're supposed to work six days a week. Do we, uh, are we breaking the Sabbath commandment if we don't work six days a week? Exodus 23, 12 says, Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your ass may have rest, and the son of your bondman, bondmaid, and the alien may be refreshed. Yeah. I, I don't think the Sabbath is trying to define what work is. No. The Sabbath, the commandment is trying to define what Sabbath is in contrast to every other thing you do. We'll talk more about that in a moment. The Sabbath is intended to be a time. We've already talked about the nature of time as opposed to the nature of, of, of material things. <coughs> it's a time to celebrate with God what he did in creation, and later we're going to find out it's a time to celebrate what he did in terms of redemption. Um, Gary already mentioned the, the fact that it's, we sometimes, the Sabbath is sometimes suggested as a a time to celebrate the Exodus and what God did getting the children of Israel out of Exodus. That's found in Deuteronomy 5, starting with verse 12. And notice that it's a little different. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy, as I, the Lord your God, have commanded you. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. On that day no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. Your slaves must rest just as you do. God has added that here to make sure that the Sabbath day is, is, is an equalizer, in a sense. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that I, the Lord your God, rescued you by my great power and strength. That is why I command you to observe the Sabbath. Now, we've got a problem here. For some people, this is a very serious problem. If God dictated the Bible, why is he giving us two different versions? The rest, of the, the rest of the Ten Commandments are verbatim. What happened here? Well, it seems to me, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at answering that question, that, that really it's, again, it's his signature, his stamp, or his seal. In the first rendition, it was because he created everything. Mm -hmm. In this last one, it's, it's a more important theme to his audience. They were, they were freed from, from slavery in Egypt, and it was God who did that. It was something that they experienced. It's something that was a very big deal, and it was a very miraculous event, and God orchestrated that. So why should he not claim that as his authority? It took the same creative power to get them out of Egypt that it did to create the world. Sure, sure. Now, yeah. why, why didn't he mix the two together? Why didn't he mention both of them 
at the same time. Fair enough, fair enough. Now there's... Uh, yeah? how, how long a time was there between the giving of the first and the second? Okay, approximately 40 years. And where is this in time for okay, the Israelites? The, the first giving of the Ten Commandments happened at the foot of Mount Sinai. Uh, the famous experience, it starts in Exodus 19, goes through really uh, and how 34. Far, how how long had they been out of Egypt? They had been out of slavery, out of Egypt, about three months. Okay, so they're said. new. They're, they're babies. New. Just out of slavery. They have been operating at the end of a whip. Okay, so now most of their the lives. second one in Deuteronomy is 40 years later, and they really should have gotten the idea. Yeah. By the end of the 40 years, Moses had been working with them and working with them. They had made a lot of mistakes. There had been rebellions. There had been all kinds of stuff. And Moses is saying, now, let's recap. Here's what happened. This is what we should have learned. This is where we are. Giving another mm -hmm. way to look at mm -hmm. the same thing. Mm -hmm. but, why, but why was it different after the 40 years? Because, because both of them happened way before Israel left Egypt. Well, l let's look at some things that are maybe significant. Was this, and, and we're, we're now talking about the issues that might affect us in, in our day, was this the first evidence of any kind of command to worship on the Sabbath? No. 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 Where did we find that already? Genesis. Creation. Genesis 1 and 2, right? Yeah. So this is not the first time. Is there evidence even in the Exodus story that the Sabbath was already known by them? Mm -hmm. Manna. The, the manna. Yeah. Yeah. The manna in Exodus 16 was, you know, they were given manna six days a week. And on the sixth day, they were given a double portion. There was no manna on the seventh day. There were several different things that happened every week to remind them that the Sabbath was a special day from God's perspective. And he wanted them to, wanted to be a special day for them. So there was no question about it. And that, and that all happened before the first giving of the Ten Commandments. So that's why in the traditional rendering of the commandment in Exodus 20, it says, remember the Sabbath day. This is not, I'm giving you something new. It's remember, right? So you've, you've given us a nice rationale for this, mm -hmm. but you have to give up the notion that the Bible was dictated in order to believe what you just given to us. Well, if you believe the Bible is dictated by God and just copied by his, his people, yeah. you've got Moses here with a little sloppy copying. That's right. Which is a problem. Yeah. So I view Exodus 20 as God created us and the universe. And in Deuteronomy 5, I recreated you, gave you your humanness back mm -hmm. by taking you out of slavery, giving you another chance to be human. Mm -hmm. Another chance to worship. Mm -hmm. Excellent. But still, the the reasons for the Sabbath are there's two different reasons. Two different. What if given God gave you lives. half a dozen reasons for the Sabbath? Would it bother you? Well, no. The more reasons, the better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The more reasons, the better. Sure. Yeah, but it's. Um, He's trying to speak with these people that haven't caught it from the manna, haven't caught it from, you know. I'm, I'm giving you another reason why I need you to come to me each week. Well, now, maybe, maybe coming out of Egypt is more important to you than the fact that I created you. Yeah, but it's so interesting that all the other nine commandments are exactly the same on the two, but those, that fourth commandment is different. And it's, yeah. it's, there must be something very significant there. And I think it's more than just another reason for, for a Sabbath. I think well, it's very interesting yeah, that God go, goes on to say in Deuteronomy 5.22, uh, uh, and you have it on the screen there in front of you, these words after the giving of the different form in Deuteronomy 5. These are the commands the Lord gave to all of you when you were gathered at the mountain, when he spoke with a mighty voice from the fire and from the thick clouds. He gave these commandments and no others. Then he wrote them on two, ta two stone tablets and gave them to me. Now, 
there are several things we can do with that passage. One thing is to say, well, obviously the Exodus 20 version must be wrong because the Deuteronomy 5 version is right according to this verse. It's not only the one that God spoke according to this verse, it's the one he wrote down. There's another very significant possibility which I think has to be the right one. I think God, in giving the Ten Commandments, gave more than what we have in either Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy 5. I think he gave enough to include both the Exodus 20 reasons and the Deuteronomy 5 reasons. And Moses, as he's writing it down, realizing that it's difficult to include everything, he can't possibly write down everything he does for 40 years. In Exodus, he seems to be focused on the creation issue. Later, he, he says, well, let me not forget about the fact that God brought us out of Egypt. And I think probably in God's original command from Sinai, both of those ideas were included. And I think over here he focuses on creation, and over here he focuses on redemption. And I think, I think Moses just decided to emphasize that one over here, and just emphasize this one over here. I think they were both a part of the original. Otherwise, we got a problem with Deuteronomy 5.22. And so what about are, so are both versions of the Ten Commandments Cliff's notes, Cliff notes on on the Ten Commandments? I think maybe you would want to say that. At least they are. I, I think when we see it, when we actually see this in panorama someday, and when and when we get to heaven, God says, "Well, look back over what happened here." Uh, I think we're going to say, "Yeah," the way He said it. Uh, whether he gives a summary and then Moses added these explanations, which is another possibility. Uh, I think we're going to see that both Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 are what's implied by what God said from Mount Sinai. Well, how long was Moses on the mount? Forty days? Forty days. The first time and then forty more days. So there, there's time for a lot of conversation to yeah. go on. Exactly. Which is, which is hard to condense and summarize in a few 20 or so verses. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to know what God wrote with his finger on the tables, but we don't yes. have that. We don't have that. But, but um, now, how about the other Sabbaths? How do they fit in? Okay, there were a number of other special rest days given for various reasons. And you call it a rest day because that's what it means, right? Yeah. Sabbath. Right, a Sabbath. Okay. There was what we now call Yom Kippur, the Day of the Lid, that's the Day of Atonement. Uh, there were other rest days, and there were whole weeks. There was the festival, festivals, etc., through the course of the year. There were three main festivals. There was Passover, there was Pentecost, which happened in March, April of our calendar, uh, Pentecost, which happened in June, basically, of our calendar, and there was um, the Day of Atonement and the th events that led up to that, which happens in September, October. And they were all called Sabbaths. These were all Sabbaths. They were supposed to come away from their usual responsibilities, leave their flocks and their crops and the whatever behind with someone to sort of look after it temporarily while they went to Jerusalem and celebrated these special Sabbaths. Yes. And some of those Sabbaths, the way they were defined, could happen on any day of the week. Yeah. Not the Passover Sabbath. I said some yes. out of out of the yeah. out of the group. There were some that could happen, that were Sabbaths that could happen on any day of the week. So we can't just say that the word Sabbath ties to the seventh, the seventh day. day. Right. In fact, the Passover is tied to a day of the month. That's right. So it could happen any day of the week. Sometimes it did line up with the seventh day Sabbath. Right. And so you, you many many times. times it did not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, in passing, we must note that it was Jesus who came down on Mount Sinai and gave those original commandments. God the Father is not the God of the Old Testament. However, I, there are statements from Ellen White suggesting that both the Father and the Son were there on Mount Sinai. But we also have statements from Ellen White that says, if God the Father had come instead of the Son, history would be no different. Right. That would be in the small book that I may know him, page 338. Mm -hmm. 
But look at what the Bible itself says. Look at 1 Corinthians 10.4. I want to make it very clear that when we're talking about Jesus here, we're talking about the God of the Old Testament is the same as the Jesus of the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 10, I'm going to read 1 to 4. It's fairly short. I want you to remember, brothers and sisters, this is Paul talking to his friends in Corinth. What happened to our ancestors who followed Moses? Clearly we know what time period he's talking about, right? They were all under the protection of the cloud and all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses, all ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. Now, Jesus himself said something very similar. Look at Luke 24, 44. Then he said to them, now this is Jesus in meeting with his disciples after um, after the, uh, re the crucifixion and the resurrection. These are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the writing of the Prophets and the Psalms had to come true. And we know now that this reference to the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms was the names of the three sections of the old, what we call the Old Testament uh, that were available in Jesus' day. So clearly he, he recognized that the Old Testament was about him. Now, let's, let's look at a slightly different aspect of this. Christ has promised to set us free from bondage. What does he set us free from? The penalty of the law. We can sin and, and not experience the penalty. Well, the penalty for breaking the law was in virtually all cases, most cases, death. Mm -hmm. And it's, we have all sinned. So we are all condemned mm -hmm. to death. And he has given us a, a, a way out. He has freed us from that, that cloud, that cloud over mm -hmm. us. You read uh, in, for in, in John there, verse 12 of the first chapter, But as many as received him, to them he gave right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Mm -hmm. Christ Object Lessons on page 314 has an interesting comment. This power is not in the human agent. It is the power of God when the soul receives Christ. He receives power to live the life of Christ. God requires perfection of his children. His law is a transcript of his own character, and it is the standard of all character. Okay. Very good. Now, to answer our question then, what does he said is free from? You said the consequences, the results of breaking the law? How about Romans 8, 2? Go ahead. For the law of the spirit of Jesus, excuse me, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Sounds like two laws, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, what does this freedom allow us to do that we could not do before? It must, we must be free from something and we must also be free to something, right? I think it allows us to live sinless. Wow. Okay. That certainly is the goal, <laughs> isn't it? The long-term goal it may not happen right now. Well, actually, I think it's a it's freedom from ignorance mm -hmm. because the law shows us the right way to go, mm -hmm. the right direction. And okay. without the law, we would be ignorant and we'd go all over the place. And yeah, the law is a kind of hedge, uh, a boundary that says, you know, this is the these are the safe areas. You know, don't go outside of this or you'll get yourself into trouble, right? Well, there's plenty of evidence that Jesus, as a faithful Jew, correctly and faithfully kept the Seventh-day Sabbath. Um, one interesting passage that deals with that is found in Matthew 12. I'm reading, not long afterwards, Jesus was walking through some cornfields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, so they began to pick ears of corn and eat the grain. 
Now, pick ears of the corn in this case. We're talking about wheat, actually. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to Jesus, Look, it is against our law for your disciples to do this on the Sabbath. They were harvesting. They were threshing. They were, you know, eating. Jesus answered, Have you never read what David did that time when he and his men were hungry? He went into the house of God. He and his men ate the bread offered to God, even though it was against the law for them to eat it. Only the priests were allowed to eat that bread. Or have you not read in the law of Moses that every Sabbath the priests in the temple actually break the Sabbath law yet they're not guilty. They're busy working in the temple on the Sabbath. I tell you that there is something here greater than the temple. The scripture says it is kindness that I want, not animal sacrifices. And of course there are many passages in the Old Testament suggesting that, especially Hosea 6.6 6 and Micah 6.6-8. 6, if you really knew what this means, Jesus said, you would not condemn people who are not guilty, for the Son of Man is Lord of Sabbath. And of course, that reminds us of Mark uh, 2, 27 and 28. Then he gives a specific, Matthew gives us a very specific example. Jesus left that place and went to a synagogue where there was a man who had a paralyzed hand. Some people were there who wanted to accuse Jesus of doing wrong, so they asked him, is it against our law to heal on the Sabbath. Now, for those of us who have a little knowledge of Greek, this poses an interesting question. What is the word for healing in Greek? Sozo. Sozo. What's the word for salvation in Greek? Sozo. Sozo. Healing is salvation in the original Greek. So, is it against the law, against our law to save on the Sabbath? the same word in Greek, right? Jesus answered, What if one of you has a sheep and it falls into a deep hole on the Sabbath? Will you not take hold of it and lift it out? Of course. Otherwise it would be a financial loss, right? And a human being is worth much more than a sheep. So then, our law does allow us to help someone on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man with the paralyzed hand, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and it became well again, just like the other one. Then the, the Pharisees left and made plans to kill Jesus. Now, we need to break this thing down just a little bit so we see the picture, what happens here. Did Jesus uh, make medicine and put it on the man's hand? Doesn't talk about it. Did he go up and say, well, let me straighten this out for you and let me fix this bone? And No, he didn't. He just spoke. What did he say? Stick your hand out. Is that against the law? Is it against the law for you to stick your hand out on the Sabbath? Or to ask someone to stretch it out. No. There's no law against asking someone to stretch out their hand on the Sabbath. Jesus didn't say heal. He didn't say, you know, bam on your forehead, you know, crash on the floor kind of thing. No. He said, stretch out your hand. There was nothing that he did that they could possibly condemn him for. So what did they do? Figure out, we, we got to get rid of this guy. Let's kill him. I have a note in my Bible that says that they made plans to kill Jesus because Jesus uh, showed that the Pharisees' rules were ridiculous. Yeah. Exactly. It's something about the Sabbath as far as talking about the Sabbath when, in Jesus' time. It seems like he's always telling them to lighten up. Mm -hmm. To lighten up. It's almost like it, I don't think he's given us any new information about the Sabbath, Eddie. I mean, during his time, during his parables, his parables or his, his sermons or well, anything? Uh, you have to be a little bit careful about how you, how you say that. It doesn't say in the Sabbath commandment, you ought to go forth and heal. You ought to go forth and preach on the, in, in the synagogue. You know, we take those things sort of for granted. That's a part of the way we worship on the Sabbath because Jesus did it, and so he read that information back into the Sabbath commandment. So in a sense, he was expanding the, command, the Sabbath commandment. He was them certainly changing it from what they were. I mean, they yeah. were totally uh, bound. bound and tied to this massive number of rituals and, and prohibitions that nobody could understand, let alone do. And so he was saying, lighten up from that. But he, how light do you want to get the Sabbath? How, how, how far out do you want to throw well, it away? You that's know? a good point, you know. You could, 
Jesus could look down through time and see that after a while people would do nothing on the Sabbath for him. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be totally light. Yeah. You know, why didn't he say anything to guard that? Because it seems like there's there's all kinds of other items that he yeah. he said that turned out as time went by they they became really important. Yeah. There were hundreds of Sabbath rules made by the Pharisees. And some of them are absolutely incredible. Let me give you a paraphrase. Uh, I, maybe I should have brought this with me, but let me just paraphrase you for you one of the rules about Sabbath keeping that the Pharisees made. They said, it's, it, if, you, if you, a man wants to go and bathe on the Sabbath in a cave or in a river, it's all right, but if he dries himself off with a towel, he's not allowed, he's not allowed to carry that towel back home. Now you say, well, okay, what's wrong? You're not supposed to, because the Sabbath command, you're not supposed to bear a burden, okay, on the Sabbath. But, if, even if ten men come, or, or, or even if, you, oh, and then the next statement is, even if you take ten towels and you dry yourself off, it's, you, you mustn't do that. You, it, that's not allowed. But if ten men go and bathe together, and they all use the same towel, it's all right to carry that towel back home. Now, you would say, hold on just a minute. How could that be possible? Well, the reason that's okay is because one man can carry the towel, which by this time would probably be very wet, while the other nine men could warn him against squeezing, which was against the law on the Sabbath. So he wouldn't squeeze the towel to, to, to get into the water out because that would be breaking the law. So they wanted to keep as far as they could from doing any laundry or drying. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's just one of many rules I, I could I could quote. So, but, but the worst part of that is that they felt that they had gained righteousness, that they were made fit for heaven mm -hmm. by obeying those rules. Yeah. And the idea of a relationship with the God of, <laughs> of yeah. the Sabbath totally missed them. Well, and the illustration of that given later is probably best in 1 John 4, 8 and 16, where it says just plainly, God is love, very familiar verse. Mm -hmm. Romans 13, 8 and 10 say that to love then is to obey the whole law. So clearly, how does that relate to the seventh-day Sabbath? Let's just see if we can spell that out. If we seek to keep the Sabbath as Jesus did, would that lead us to become more like him? Would it lead us to become more loving? I think a correct keeping of the Sabbath. I mean, if you go out and your, your goal as... I mean, Jesus went out of... Let's just be very honest. Jesus went out of his way to perform miracles of healing on the Sabbath. He went out of his way. I mean, healing a man who is born blind or, or, or healing a man who's been paralyzed for 38 years, those are not emergency surgeries, okay? There's no way you can call those emergencies, okay? So Jesus went out of his way to try to teach about the correct observance of the Sabbath. I think we all would have to agree with that. Well, now, Many arguments have been tried. In fact, entire books have been written to try to explain that the Seventh-day Sabbath is no longer required for Christians. Do you see any evidence in the Gospels that Jesus was trying to change the day of worship? No. no. Some have tried to suggest that the fact that Jesus opposed the way in which the Pharisees kept the Sabbath, and we were talking about this a moment ago, mm -hmm. was proof that he was trying to change it. Yes, but he Jesus, was trying to. He was trying, trying to, to change to. from the distortions that they had gone to. Yeah, but Jesus was merely trying to reestablish the correct keeping of the Sabbath as opposed to a kind of rigid, legalistic observation of hundreds of rules for Sabbath keeping which had developed through the Pharisees primarily in Jesus' day. Those rules turned the Sabbath into a great burden. Jesus intended for us to learn that the Sabbath is supposed to be a time for doing loving deeds it is a time to show our love not only for God, but also for our fellow human beings. And of course, we have verses for that, don't we? Well, what do we know about 
some of the things that Jesus specifically did on the Sabbath? Any things that jump in your mind right off? Well, he healed, that's for sure. Yeah, we've talked about that. John 5 and John 9 are excellent examples of that. And he wasn't offended when the Pharisees thrashed the wheat. Didn't seem to be. When his disciples yeah. thrashed the wheat. Disciples. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Pharisees. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Disciples, yeah. What else do we know about? Uh, spoke in the synagogue. He spoke in the synagogue frequently, and he healed in the synagogue, didn't he? Yes. And he read the scripture. And Luke 4 tells us it was his custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. And he was often asked to read scripture. So those are things that he did. Uh, many of our Christian friends would tell us, well, we, we don't argue with the fact that Jesus was a Jew and he was compliant as a Jew to doing all the things Jews are supposed to do. So yeah, he did those things. But we celebrate the day of his resurrection. Is there any suggestion that uh, we should change our day of worship to celebrate the day of the resurrection? No, he gave us, he gave us a, a right to celebrate the resurrection in baptism. Every single one of the four Gospels spells out in considerable detail the relationship between the day Jesus died, the day he rested in the grave, and the day he rose back to life. Mm -hmm. I'm going to choose the one in Luke 23, starting with verse 52. It's a little more detailed than some of the others. He went into the presence of Pilate and asked for the... This was... Maybe I should start with 51, 50, 51. There was a man named Joseph of Arimathea, a town in Judea. He was a good and honorable man who was waiting for the coming of the kingdom of God. Although he was a member of the council, so this man was a Pharisee, I'm sure he wasn't a Sadducee. He was a Pharisee, but a member of the Sanhedrin. He had not agreed with the, their decision and action. So here is Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were both members of the Sanhedrin, but they were secretly following Jesus. He went into the presence of Pilate, now this is after Jesus is dead, and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took the body down, wrapped it in a linen sheet, and placed it in a tomb which had been dug out of solid rock and which had never been used. It was Friday, and the Sabbath was about to begin. Is that pretty clear? The women who had followed Jesus from Galilee went with Joseph and saw the tomb and how Jesus' body was placed in it. Then they went back home and prepared the spices and perfumes for the body. On the Sabbath, they rested as the law commanded. Is there any suggestion here that there's about to, to, to uh, inaugurate a new day of worship? Not so far. Not so far. In the next chapter, which, of course, remember, there were no verse divisions, no chapter divisions in the original. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb carrying the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the entrance to the tomb, so they went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it goes on talking about the events of Resurrection Day. But there's nothing at all here about, well, I want you to worship on this day. Nothing of that sort at all. So... Um, it's interesting to notice, for one thing, that just as God finished his work in creation week and then rested, Jesus finished his 33 years of work here on this earth, died on Friday, and rested on the Sabbath. Does that say anything to us? It's consistent. Consistent. He had lived a life of sinlessness. He died on Friday. He rested on the Sabbath. But God could hardly wait to get him out of that grave and back to heaven to celebrate. I mean, can you imagine what the angels were thinking when Sunday morning showed up? If Jesus intended to change the Sabbath in any way, surely he should have done so in the final days of his life on this earth. I mean, wouldn't that be the logical time? Mm -hmm. or at least on after the resurrection. But there is no hint of any such thing, even after his death, which could reasonably be called the conclusion to the plan of redemption, Jesus was still resting on the seventh-day Sabbath. I mean, when he was dead on Calvary, was the plan of salvation complete? Mm -hmm. No. Nope. Not quite, but nearly. Okay? There was nothing to be changed, really, after that. 
uh, the devil had been defeated and Jesus was still resting on the Sabbath, right? If he hadn't come out of the grave, the devil hadn't been yeah. defeated. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, it's almost like it's almost like when you look at these Sabbaths that had this end of work creation, getting out of getting freed from the the um, Egyptian. Egyptians, Jesus dying on, on the cross, mm -hmm. that they're all kind of tying together mm -hmm. to say something. Mm -hmm. Which um, what do you think that would be? I would say it's pointing to the great controversy. Okay. Well, certainly, the one thing we could say for sure, and, it, and that's this. We have various national holidays in which we celebrate this or that or the other. We have the 4th of July. We don't celebrate the 4th of July on the 5th of July or the 20th of July. It has to be on the 4th of July no matter what day of the week it comes on, right? We have other holidays. Now, for convenience, we've now started fudging on some of those things and putting more and more holidays on Monday so that they, we get longer weekends and that kind of stuff. But basically, Memorial Day is Memorial Day and, and so forth, you see. Thanksgiving. Yeah, Thanksgiving. It has a specific Thursday. day. Christmas has a specific day. So what God seems to be doing is saying, okay, I want you to celebrate the Sabbath because of what I did at creation. Now I want you to celebrate the Sabbath because I did what I did in get you out of Egypt. Now I want you to celebrate the Sabbath because of what I did in the plan of salvation and, and dying and resting and rising from the dead on, the, on Sabbath and Sunday uh, at this time. So Jesus keeps wanting to, it's, it seems he's keeping pouring more and more meanings into that day in which we're supposed to be fellowshipping with him. But even at this time, the time that Jesus lived here, or going back uh, to, to the beginning of the Jewish history, to go back to Egypt, uh, weren't there, there are pagans and heathen that worshipped on other days of the week, on Sunday? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that seems to me to raise big question mark, in, at least in my mind. Why would we want to shift from the day that, that Jesus consecrated Mm -hmm. uh, when he created the earth and when he lived here, why would we want to go jump onto a pagan holiday? Yeah. Well, you know, I think there's really nothing wrong with celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. No. There's nothing wrong no. with that. But I guess what we're saying here is that if you concentrate on that, you might be missing something mm -hmm. because there's, there's actually something happening here. There's, there's tie-ins that are happening all through history, and um, and if you let that celebration distract you from that, you might be losing out on something. Well, we're 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 running out of time here, but be between Acts 13 and 15, we we read the story of Paul, and repeatedly, what does Paul do? He goes into the synagogue and worships with the Jews on Sabbath, and he doesn't leave the synagogue until they chase him out basically. Then we have examples. Another example is found in Acts 20, verse 7. Take a look at that. Acts 20, verse 7. Now my version, having already done the hard work for us, says, On Saturday evening we gathered together for the fellowship meal. Paul spoke to the people and kept on speaking until midnight since he was going to leave the next day. Now is that a reason why we should start worshiping on Sunday? No, that was Saturday night. That was Saturday night. Now, in the traditional translations, it will it'll be worded a little differently. Uh, if you read the, my, the little thing here, it'll say Saturday or Sunday, so forth. It'll say on the evening of the first day of the week, I think, if you have a, one of the more traditional translations, doesn't it? Acts 20, verse 7. Actually, I could look at it here real quick. The King James says... On the first day of the week, the New King James. Yeah. The traditional King James says, upon the first of the week, the word day is not in there, upon the first of the week, when the disciples came together, the big bad Paul preached unto them. But you have to understand how they reckon time. Yeah. That time started at sundown. Mm -hmm. 
Each day started at sundown. Each day started at sundown. I mean, you kind of knew when the sun went down. Mm -hmm. you, didn't, uh, you didn't have a sundial which would tell you when midnight was. Yeah. Uh, but but you could uh, look out the window and say, oh, the sun's about to yeah. about to go down. The old, there were only two times in the day when you could say precisely, whoop, that's that's that happened. And, and that was, if you didn't have a watch, you didn't have a chronometer, you didn't have any fancy timepieces, and that was sunrise or sundown. And God says, I choose to start days at sundown. Dark part first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, another text that sometimes suggests as a favorite favoring a new day of worship is 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Uh, let's look at that. If I can get my toys to work here. Okay. Every Sunday, each of you must put aside some money in proportion to what you have earned and save it up so that there will be no need to collect money when I come. Is this a hint that we should worship on a different day? No. What's this talking about? You should do your accounting mm -hmm. on the first day of the week. Yes. Plan. Plan ahead. Now, plan giving. Yeah. <laughs> Paul is saying, I want you to, you know, we're taking up a major offering to help the saints down in Jerusalem. And I'm going to come by and I'm going to collect that money from you well, me and my friends are going to carry it there. So I want you to plan. I don't want anyone, you know, not prepared. So every week I want you to sit down and think about how much can you contribute. Okay? So let's see if we can um, come to the conclusion here. Do you find the Sabbath to be a great blessing? Every Friday evening do you look forward to it? Try to imagine what, what will be like your perfect day with family, friends, whatever. Does that, is that anything like what, the way you now celebrate the Sabbath? When he was here on this earth, why do, you, why do you think Jesus spent more time healing than preaching? Gospel Workers, page 43. His miracles were not just a way of attracting people to his meetings. Jesus performed miracles, did his healing, did these things in connection with the Sabbath because he wanted, to understand, he wanted us to understand that healing is a part of the gospel, a part of the salvation that he provided for us and which he wants us all to share. See you next week.